This is CX of M Radio, the voice of customer experience professionals. podcast. This is your host, Darren Hood. Thanks for taking the time to join us on today. Special welcome, as always, to those who are joining us for the first time. We're going to continue with our current potpourri segment, and this time I'm not going to rant today, at least I don't think I am, but we're going to pick up on the actual list of topics that I intended on covering with a slight bit of doubling back to sort of wrap up one of the things that I was mentioning last week that was related to the list, but we're going to dive right in on today. Uh, uh, I do want to address one thing uh, just to remind people about the upcoming UX Chit Chat Hour. Remember, the Chit Chat Hour is held on the last Friday of each month at 12 15, starts at 1215 Eastern Time. It lasts for roughly two hours. We know some people are at work, they can't stay the entire time, but, but folks value the ability to connect with UXers from around the world, even if it's for just a half hour. So a lot of people are going to come in. I want to start promoting that here on the podcast, just to make people aware of that, uh, because that, that time that you have to engage with other people, it can really broaden your horizons. It can really give you some additional things to think about that will sharpen you. It can give you some tips that will help you in your job seeking and your interviewing things of that nature. Uh, There are a lot of really well-spoken and and well-qualified UX people who do attend these sessions. This is not just for me, but there's a lot of great people who come to these and have some wonderful things to say and share. So I do encourage people to come out. So that's it. Now let's pick up where we left off. And the one topic I want to double back on just a tad involves, and it was actually part of the reason I ended up going on that rant last week, had to do with, the danger of sanctioning unauthorized voices. And I do want to express my sentiments about another common practice that I'm seeing that's connected to that. And I saw another post on social media where somebody was saying, Hey, who do you know? Who would you recommend to follow when it comes to UX on social media? And they were speaking for the most part of LinkedIn, but other places as well. But for the most part, yeah, LinkedIn. And some people were, they were mentioning all kinds of folks out there. And the funny thing about these lists, and, you know, I was on it, other people I know were on it, people who come to the UX Chit Chat Hour were appearing on this list. There were there were lots of folks who were being listed. But as I looked through the names of people who were, who were being suggested as folks to follow, some of these people were the unauthorized voices that I was making reference to. Now, I say all the time, I've, I've, I spent a whole segment on a podcast addressing this once before, and I tell people all the time that when folks first come into UX, they do not have a filter. They have what I call baby bird syndrome. They will accept anything that anybody is saying about UX, pretty much. The critical thinking hat is either not on or it just isn't, it's not at the point at which somebody can say, that you should listen to this or you shouldn't listen to that or I should listen to this and I should listen to that and people making these personal statements, which they should do. And and, and there are some people who are relatively new that do a pretty good job at doing what they can in their state. And, of course, we all had to build our our filter. It's just that, uh, as again, as I always say, prior to 2011, there was no misinformation in UX. So when I was coming up in UX, I could just pick up anything. I could go to any conference. I could engage with anybody, and it would be pretty much beneficial. Today, that's not the case. Uh, you have a lot of people who are fabricating things. You have people who are flat out making things up. You have people that are stealing things, and, and then they, they're rebranding things. And, and then a lot of them are doing it for the express purpose of generating a following. Because there are a lot of narcissists that are running amok in UX today. And those people 
want followers. They're not really interested in the progress of the people that are listening to them. They're interested in being followed. I, I, I've seen people who know nothing. They don't really, they don't have any experience in the discipline and they labor to build a following because they just want people to pay attention to them. They've been like that since they were four years old, for God's sake. Everybody, look at me, look at me. And, and, and that, if that doesn't get checked, that look at me, look at me mindset doesn't get checked. It actually matures. And, and that's what you end up seeing with these people who bring nothing to the table. But yet, even though they don't, as adults, they don't say, look at me, look at me. But their behaviors say, look at me, look at me. And when somebody has no real experience, and in many cases, and if folks had filters, they would recognize what I'm about to say. When somebody's, what they're saying and the volume in which they're speaking is actually not truly reflective of the experience level, then something is wrong. And a lot of the people I mentioned earlier who who are starting to use or have used critical thinking and they take time to examine and validate the things that they're saying. Actually, and when I say validate, they're subjecting what they're hearing to scrutiny. They're looking it up. They're, they're looking up various uh, uh, thoughts on the topic, various, various resources on the topic. Because resources are out there, books are out there. there. There's a lot of valid information. It's just outnumbered today by invalid information. So if folks are not careful, you end up hearing things that you should have been avoiding, and then you end up creating problems. You end up creating what we'll call, for the sake of this point, UX personal maturity debt. Because you end up having to go back and make corrections on your work, you end up having to go back and change your mindset. You end up having to go back and clean up spilled milk. You end up having to go back and 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 tell someone, "Hey, you know, I was actually wrong about that." You have to you have to do some some reputation maintenance because something that you embraced and something that you taught it, it was not is not something that you recognize as something you shouldn't do. I, I I mean, a great example of this, and this is an EQ issue, by the way, that when people do. When people have, I should say, really good, high, desirable levels of EQ, you're willing to go back and eat crow. You're willing to go back and admit, you know what? I was flat out wrong about that, and I'm sorry that I endorsed that. I I, I heard uh, Dr. Ari tell a story on an event recently where he, he really exemplified this, and it was fantastic to hear because folks would have thought, there's no way in the world Dr. Ari loves and embraces the democratization of, of UX research. But there was a time that he said that he was on that bandwagon, but the more he looked at it and, and, and we got to give everybody an opportunity and, and room for error there. We're going to make errors. We're going to make errors in judgment. We're going to make errors. And there are things that, that we've done one way at one time. And there's no way in the world we do that again. And practically everybody has been there and experienced it. But he said that he eventually came to the point that he realized how 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 detrimental it was to engage in the democratization of UX research. And so he pivoted. And and so people have to have the the wherewithal, the willingness to pivot. You're going to look wrong in front of people when that happens. You have to embrace it. You would hope that they would embrace it. A lot of people won't, especially trolls. They're going to try to ride you for that. And, and and you know, just trolls, you just got to let what they do sort of like roll down the sleeve because they're just who they are. And they're not they're not trying to help anybody or do anything constructive. They just like fussing. And they've been like that since they were four years old or so, if not before that. But we've got to give people room for error. You, you deserve and you reserve, should reserve the right to change your mode of thinking. And, and so these are things that are just going to be done. And, and then we're going to make discoveries about people and the things that they stand for. And, and when these things happen, then we're all going to pivot. And, and so, I, I mean, when it comes to sanctioning of unauthorized voices, I, I, there are people that have embraced me that became trolls. And when that happens, I'm, I'm done. I, 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 I refuse to waste time on people who love wasting time and trolls 
are time wasters. They're time bandits. Uh, they're not really in it for even their own personal personal growth. They they get more satisfaction out of uh, just creating and causing a stir among things. And and some people think that I'm trying to do that. I'm not trying to do that at all. I'm actually trying to bring attention to something that's being overlooked that folks should have embraced. So I'm not trying to stir the pot when I bring these things up. I'm addressing something that really a lot of people in my position should be doing. And, and I look like I'm like out here doing this by myself sometimes. There's not too many people who are willing to say the things that I'm saying. Uh, but it's it's no, it's, it, it's not that at all. It's It's that the things that are said, I mean, the democratization of UX research, just tapping into that once again, I recognize the danger of it. I recognize that it, it doesn't speak well of the discipline. Anytime people think that uh, that it's okay to share a message that anybody can do our work, anybody can't do our work. There's a lot of specialized knowledge that goes into doing UX, which is interesting that a lot of the people who run around, they either go and get degrees, they go to boot camps, they, they go to the Google course, whatever, and folks know where I stand on, on these things, but they do it because they recognize that it's going to take some specialized knowledge and you can't just up and do it. Now, some people think that you can learn it in six months or as I've seen it, seen people advertise, you can learn how to do it UX in as little as nine days. You can't. Uh, uh, some people think that when they hear us use certain terminology that they can start using the same terminology and just running around and doing our job. No, this, it, it takes specialized knowledge to do UX work and but when you when you when you endorse or teach other people like a thimble full of things and then try to get them to believe that they can do UX work, we're actually putting a Dunning Kruger hat on the discipline. And 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 when we're just passing these these hats out and and these types of things, everybody should be speaking out against things like this. Anybody who knows. What real UX work is should be speaking out against these things. And you should know it's it's burying the discipline right now. For years, I said UX was under siege. For years, I've been talking about posers, retrofits, and upstarts. But what do we see? We see a lot of posers, retrofits, and upstarts. And, and posers, retrofits, and upstarts do not help the discipline at large. There are some retrofits that make it and what do I mean by retrofit? As a person who was in one position who transitioned into UX, but you know, I don't care where you came from. You got to learn how to do the work. And sometimes where you came from can help you. It'll give you a different vantage point. It'll help you bring certain, certain, certain viewpoints. I, I should say certain viewpoints to the table that, that puts a different spin on your angle of UX. And that's all fine. And that's valuable actually, to have these diverse viewpoints about what's going on. However, UX is still UX. Nobody has the right to change UX, uh, and you can't change UX, even though it looks like they're changing UX. As we talked about, we were saying that UX is not dying, but we cannot try to sell the mindset that other people can do our work. It's a crime that people are doing this, and that's why you see UX not bringing value and that's why you see things being watered down. And that's why you see a rush of people coming into UX because they think it's easy because somebody sold them on that. The people who sell them on that are not doing real UX work, frankly. Uh, the people who believe that are not doing real UX work because if you were doing real UX work, you wouldn't feel that way. And, and I had a, a, a LinkedIn post that I shared just very recently within the last 24 hours where I was saying something on the line of how when someone, if they respect you as a practitioner, they will not even, other people will not try to do your work. You, This is another problem in UX. And it's something I've seen for years. I talk to people about it all the time. They share their stories, how that people up and try to do their work. And this is after having engaged with them. When they're trying to actually do the work, that's called displacement. That's not, people think that they're helping. No, it's displacement. And, and when you have displacement, part of displacement in the dynamic of what I'm referring to is an act of disrespect. Is disrespect for the discipline? 
is disrespect for for the brand of UX and is disrespect in many cases for the individual that they are, whether it's intentional or unintentional, whether it's passive or direct, it is an act of disrespect. And and but it's funny, I'm I'm not really ragging on the people doing it as much as I am on the people who are actually fostering it. We need to demonstrate UX in such a way that people wouldn't dare think of trying to do our job when it's not their job. If you're making it look too simple, that's when people get emboldened and then they want to get engaged. So, so, and all of this turns into the sanctioning back to the, what I was trying to address the sanctioning of, of unauthorized voices and, and the issue of where the filter plays into that sort of roping myself in here is that when you have people who try to speak, not just try to do the work because they are trying to do the work, the unauthorized voices that they're not equipped to do. Uh, and they're not afraid to try to do it because they don't have any respect for it. And when you have people with, with a scant amount of experience who put themselves out there, I even saw an instance recently where somebody has no real UX experience and they were charging people to come and hear what they had to say about something. When you have people like me, a whole bunch of people like me who love the discipline so much, who respect the discipline so much and really care about those that are up and coming that they're willing to give their information out for free. Yeah. Is it wrong to charge? No, especially if the, if it's a business model and you have people like curiosity tank. Yeah. Michelle Ronson's doing fantastic work. With, with Curiosity Tank, it is her business to teach people about UX research. Fantastic. Uh, the folks over with with uh, the influential researcher and with the cult of curiosity, teaching people to do UX research and charging people to be in a cohort, that's fine. Charging people to educate is fine. But there are people doing these little one-offs. There are people who crawled out of a gutter and decided to start sharing the, the little five minutes worth of what they know about UX and then charging people for it. And then people are willing to pay. I mean, these people would be nowhere if nobody would opt into it. The people who are opting in are actually uh, at fault because they're giving these people a platform. If it, if it's, if they're offering these people with the unauthorized voices, a platform to share their filth uh, then they're at fault. But these people who, I mean, it's a demonstration of arrogance. I mean, if if I read three or four articles over and over again about actual building architecture and then went to to an event and was trying to apply to be a speaker or trying to get somebody who was impressed by the knowledge of what I regurgitated from those articles and someone offered me the ability to speak and then I wanted to charge for that, I wanted to be paid for it, that would be high treason with regard to architecture and a lot of people who are experienced in architecture, if they were angry because I was doing it, they'd be right for feeling that way. It's sad that we have seasoned UX people who are the ones who are giving people these voices and then turning around and, and, and the, the, the social media posts I was referring to suggesting that, Hey, you got to listen to this person. They have a lot to say. No, they don't. No, they don't. And, and some of them are even trolls. And people are endorsing trolls. That kind of stuff creates hostility, and it sets the discipline back. Uh, and and for me, it, it really stirs me up because I'm one of the people out here trying to clean up the messes that all these people leave behind. And people get upset about it. But, man, can you imagine if, because, again, I'm not the only person sounding off about these things, but can you imagine where we'd be if none of us were doing this work? And this is work that we do of our own. It's our own dime, our own time addressing this stuff simply because we care about the discipline and we care about people. And so if people want to, you want to, you want to make me to be the bad guy because I care about people. You know, there were some recent popular politicians who actually made this kind of stuff famous because these people didn't used to be as blatant as they are. But some of these recent politicians used to do this stuff on a regular basis in, in everybody's purview. And uh, they made it popular and they encouraged these people to engage in the same kind of practice. So it's gotten worse since that time, but we need to stop 
sanctioning these unauthorized voices. So next topic is something I want to call, or and, and I didn't coin this phrase, but but calling uh, the hidden dangers of bandwagon bias. And it's related to the last point that I brought up, that there's something called the bandwagon effect. It, it, it is a bias where people have a habit of adopting certain behaviors or beliefs or following certain people because many other people are doing the same. And so looking back at that example I gave of that social media post where people are saying, who's somebody that you recommend? And and so really what they're doing is, I it, it's not that it's a, a bad practice. It's almost like with reviews. Hey, this thing got a lot of great reviews. Hey, let's go check it out kind of thing. Uh, but it, it's sort of kind of, it's something that's unavoidable. When people think that they find something valuable and they suggest it or they like it, or they embrace it, other people are going to do the same thing. And so here you have not knowing that people are engaging in bandwagon bias. That's what's being pretty much put out there. So when bandwagon bias is is going wild, you have the baby birds who don't have filters. This is one of the main dangers. The baby birds are going to gravitate. Oh, that person knows something about ABC. Man, I want to listen to them. And the next thing you know, for six months, You've been, you've been listening to somebody that you should have been avoiding the entire time because they're really not saying anything of value or they've rebranded something that existed for 20 years prior to them putting it out there or they're saying something that, I mean, I, I heard a very, very famous UX person make make a statement on social media in the last week where they said that the next big thing is is trying to, I'm trying to remember as best what the person said. So I'm not going to say it verbatim here, but they talked about how did the next big thing with regard to UX research is to use it for strategic work to do research that, that fuels your strategy in your UX practice. There's nothing new about that. (laughs) Absolutely nothing new about that. But if people who don't have filters They see that, and then they wonder, wow, that's a great thought because they're not doing it, or they've never seen it, or they've never digested it, so they think that that's great. So then as soon as you hear this person make this statement, then you opt in, and of course, they said it, so you figure you can learn about it from them, so you go to them, and this particular person, that's what they do for a living, so they're they're not going back to their job and practicing it, they're trying to sell you on it. So they're going to make God knows how many tens of thousands of dollars on trying to inform people how to do this. When basically, if you just engage in your UX research practice and start taking time to dedicate to benchmarking, isn't that going to help fuel your strategy? And and how many of us, here's the funny thing about about doing benchmarking research, we usually don't have the time in the UX research practice to engage in benchmarking. I've been in companies before, we talk about benchmarking. We talk about how much we'd love to do benchmarking. We talk about getting ahead of the work that we're getting from our stakeholders and clients and internal clients, but we don't have the time to do it. So it becomes a thing that we think about and we talk about, but it never becomes part of the actual plan. And and then the other thing you think about is when you're if you're doing actual UX research the right way, you're doing your research, and then you're analyzing the data, and then you're synthesizing the data, and and just paying attention to that over time and seeing trends also facilitates your strategic practices from a UX strategy perspective on your teams in your organizations. So so this this whole thing about this is new, it, it's not new at all. It, it, I was just, I, I'm, I'm appalled and I'm not shocked anymore about how ridiculous some of the things that circulate in the UX community are. And, and then people, they hear me talking about, oh, you're just being negative. No, actually, again, I'm not of the camp of positive and negative. I'm of the, of the camp of constructive and destructive. And one of the things that if you really want to 
call you if you insist on using the terminology of negative, but ignore the fact that negative really has to do with how things are impacted and not how something makes you feel, which is very childish, by the way. <laughs> Just gonna say it. Um, then you're missing out on some huge opportunities to make things better for yourself, for your teams, and you know, down the line, your users, your clients, your the whole nine yards. Um, it's actually negative to stick your head in the ground and ignore something that's critical. So if you insist on using that terminology, let's look at it for what it is. Uh, if, if you if you engage in ostrich ostrich effect bias, which is really what it's called, uh, because you you see something, it makes you feel uncomfortable, so you decide to pretend it isn't there. That's very immature, uh, and it's very counterproductive, and it's very destructive. But at any rate, back to my point. The person is talking about this quote unquote new thing, then people are going to, because of the person's reputation, they're going to, they're just simply going to embrace what is being said. And then they're going to follow it. And the numbers of people that are, that are starting to, to gather behind this, this faux topic increases. And then other people who know nothing about it, it's like when you see there's a bunch of people standing over there looking at something. I wonder what they're looking at. And the next thing you know, they, they hear what it's about, and then they simply embrace it because a lot of people are there. It, it, it's just, it's it's not, isn't it weird that in a discipline that is 100% dependent on critical thinking, that we have so many people who refuse to engage in critical thinking at critical times? So it, it's something, if you want to succeed, if you want to be better, you know, people are always talking about stand out. You want to stand out, engage in critical thinking. <laughs> you, you'll stand out because people will say, wow, you know, what you said, that really makes sense because what they're saying doesn't. And you'll, you'll have more of an understanding of what you should be embracing the more you engage in critical thinking because when you engage in critical thinking, you know not only will you see what really makes sense, but you'll be able to anticipate what users, stakeholders, and clients make sense. What it, what makes sense to them, and then it helps you to to forge a better path. So beware of bandwagon bias, folks. Don't just follow something because other people are. Uh, don't just create uh, a a, de- a a devil's advocate mindset just to be a cr- a contrarian. Because now you're going down troll road. That's what trolls like to do. They just, they just like to be contrarian about something. They don't know if it deserves a contrarian viewpoint or mindset or or uh, to have that opposition. They just do it because they don't like following anything. There's some people that they just love being anarchists. And so, and if you don't recognize that, which is it'd be an EQ related thing to be able to recognize it. If you don't recognize it, uh, then you're going to be in trouble. So I'm trying to help you get out of trouble. Okay, so that's actually positive. So we'll we'll use the toxic positivity folks terms here for a few moments. That that would be positive. It would qualify as positive uh, to do that. So let let's be about building ourselves today. Next topic, and then we're going to wrap up here um, for today, and we'll continue this again next week. There was a question that came up in a discussion, and and so I sort of structured it for a presentation on the podcast to present it so it'll be easier to digest. And the topic had to do with uh, the popularity. It sort of related to something I said earlier, actually, but why isn't UX popular among stakeholders? Why, why is it that a lot of stakeholders like to push back just about the concept of UX? I mean, people are more likely to embrace product than they are UX. And, and yeah, the two things are quite different. And uh, they, a lot of people like to brand themselves as UX folks when they're doing product, but the the dynamics of operation in true product work and true UX work they they they're very different. And a lot of folks say, "I you know I'm just going to go and be a product designer. I'm going to go and be a product manager. I still get to do UX work." You may or may not. It, it depends on where you work, because real UX work calls for some some interactive dynamics. And some work-related dynamics that product people are not really engaging in. And and if you try to do it, you're going to be rejected. You're going to end up looking for another job because people don't want the pushback. They don't want 
the critical thinking. They don't want the voice of reason. Product managers and product designers don't have to have a voice of reason and they don't have to use critical thinking. I've seen a ton of, of product people who they just say whatever is popular and then they're loved for it. They're like politicians. The politicians of UX are, are the, it would be the average product designer, if you will. It's amazing. And a lot of them, they want to have a voice and, and, they they judge whether or not they're being successful when they have a voice by the number of people that love them. It reminds me of that old Sally Field quote that that circulates from the from when, from when she won the Academy Award. You love me, you really love me, and that's what where a lot of people where their minds are. It's like a popularity contest, and that's not what UX is. So people need to be more careful about that. Uh, uh, but sadly, that's becoming popular. There's a bandwagon behind that today. It has a head full of steam. And, and people are, are rushing to embrace that person and that mindset and that practice. And because it's so close to UX, they get branded as UXers. And, and then they people walk away thinking that, well, this is how UX is done. And, and none of this is correct. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the folks who are, who are product designers, they are order takers. And one of the reasons that UX is is not popular is because stakeholders don't like the fact that you're not taking orders. They think that you're there to take their orders. They don't realize that the UX person is basically a scientist that's here to, to examine things, to confirm the right way to, to go forward so that we can generate successes for the business and for the users. The product people just trying to produce something. And a lot of times, you know, there's no such thing as UX UI if there was anything that was UX UI, if there was such a thing, it'd be the product people because a lot of them, they are focused on on the presentation layer. They're not focused on the 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 cognitive load, if you will, and things of that nature. A lot of them claim to be. They're, they're not. <laughs> not. Not really. And and so the, the stakeholders don't like the fact that UX folks are not order takers, and that's where you have some of the consternation and what amounts to healthy conflict. That comes up and sometimes it's not healthy, but it's just conflict, just flat out conflict um, because we're not order takers and they don't understand that. So business have tried to change you extras into order takers. The rise of the product designer is actually part of that. And it puts qualified people into a strange position, but it also helps explain why you see so many unqualified people getting these roles because they really don't know what it is to do the UX work. But the people behind all of that hiring and the formulation of the departments don't really know and don't really care anyway. And that's why you end up in these types of situations. But it's not popular. UX isn't popular among stakeholders because we're not order takers, basically. Real UXers stand their ground and we're determined to practice true and pure UX. The stakeholders don't want that. <laughs> They're not interested in pure UX. They're not interested in in doing things the right way. And they, a lot of them have seen all the data for every dollar you invest, you get up to a hundred or up to 250 in return, depends on which report you're reading, but it's still a great ROI. Um, they don't realize that you have to have pure UX to achieve that. You're not going to come anywhere near that by going the product route where people are order takers. So it takes pure UX to get the ROI, to be design led and outperform the competition by up to 228%. And one DMI report from a few years ago said that the last one was more like 216. And then there's another report somewhere else that was more like 240. Uh, that w- w- that was the ROI and, and where the, how the de- design led companies were outperforming the competition by that much. It was more than what DMI was talking about. You're not going to get that. Unless you get pure UX, you'll get people deploying something. You'll get people something that that's that's meeting someone's requirements, but it doesn't meet the requirements the way that things are supposed to be meeting the requirements. So you don't get the ROI. So this is critical. And then lastly, on this topic, it's funny that we don't change our stripes. We don't real people who are committed. This is a challenge. Because if you're if you're determined to do real UX, it's going to put you in the, what today is a minority. 
amongst UXers, if you're not willing to change your stripes, if you're not willing to become an order taker, if you're not willing to play politics, if you're not willing to dumb down what you're doing just so you can get a check and misrepresent the discipline because they basically, when you're willing to misrepresent the discipline because of the money you're getting, that is really a bribe. And so you're selling out the discipline for your own personal gain. Pure UXers, we will not change our stripes when we're presented with this flurry of corporate bribes, if you will, which is called a paycheck. Just because you're getting a paycheck doesn't mean that you're honest. It doesn't mean that you're genuine. And it surely doesn't mean that you're a real practitioner of UX. If you get a paycheck, it means you get a paycheck. And the people in payroll don't know what you are. And the people who who brought you in don't necessarily know who you are. Not when all of this hiring today of non-UXers running UX teams. No, they don't know. And, and they will. If you learn to push back and do it diplomatically, people are going to respect that. They're going to understand it. These people are smart. I'm not calling them stupid by any stretch of the imagination. They're smart. And you got sometimes people are smart but they don't know what they don't know. And there's certain things they're not considering until you push a particular button. And when you give them something to think about that they hadn't considered before, because remember they're not wired to be UXers. That's why they can't try to do your job. They're not wired to be UXers. So when you give them that thing to think about, they hadn't thought about and it starts to click and the light bulb comes on. They go, wow. Not only do they go, man, I see it now. But they start to recognize that this type of stuff only comes out of the camp of the UXer. Then they start to recognize and respect UX for what it is. Then we're in a better position, folks. So that's why we need to take a stand and we need to represent UX the right way. Folks, we're going to we're going to stop there. Uh, There there are some other topics I've got listed, but we're not going to going to extend the time or prolong the time on today. We'll pick up and we'll have one more week of this round of UX Potpourri. And then we've got some some UX uh, symposium sessions that are uh, that are on the docket that we're we're finishing the, the final touches on so we can get it out here so you can hear what some of these new and mid-level UXers have to say about the discipline. So but thanks again for taking the time to join us on the day. Thanks again for your patience in listening. Thanks again for your willingness to engage in critical thinking so you can be in better shape here today and so you can help the discipline to be in better shape because we are at a crossroads today, which is why I made that plea last week. We're in a crossroads, and I hope you're willing to take a stand and fight the good fight of UX here today. So until next time, this is the host of the World of UX, Darren Hood, wishing you all the best. And until then, happy UXing, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this session of CX of M Radio. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit cxofm.org for more resources.